What's up everyone? My name is Untamed Mando and welcome to my YouTube channel or welcome back to my YouTube channel. We are back again for another episode of Netflix's live action One Piece where we are sailing the high seas with Luffy, with Monkey D. Luffy and the Straw Hat Gang before they officially become the Straw Hat Gang. If you guys remember, the last episode was a doozy of a first episode. Luffy found Nami and San... Not Sanji, my apologies. Luffy found Nami and Zoro, and they were able to escape the island. Our buddy was able to punch the, the choppy choppy man's son get him let the straw hat crew escape so that is where we left off and as soon as they leave the island we see a jolly roger in the distance a giant ship with a clown jolly roger and for those of you who are familiar with the one piece anime you'll know exactly who this maniac of a clown pirate is and let's get into this episode one piece episode two recap Buggy's Big Top Bonanza. That is a mouthful. And of course, as always, there are spoilers because this is a review of this episode, episode two of Netflix's live action one piece. So if you do not like spoilers, please go ahead and watch one of my other videos and come back to this video later. But do not forget to actually watch this video, please. The Straw Hats are trapped in Buggy, the Clown Circus, and Buggy might just be a tad sensitive of a big glaring issue. I don't know about y'all, but I thought this, this, uh, this, uh, badonkadonk of a nose, badonkadonk of a nose was fake. I forgot that this is actually real. <laughs> this is his nose. He has a condition. <laughs> <laughs> I uh I laughed when I rem when I recalled. I was like, "Oh. So the that big nose is not just for looks. It's actually a condition. I feel like he needs to have that looked at. He needs to have a doctor kind of examine like, "Hey doc, my nose is a little off." And he'd be like, "Your nose is really off." <laughs> but hey, now that Luffy, Zoro, and Nami have officially set sail, map to the Grand Line in hand with Shell's Town in shambles, I wouldn't say it was in shambles. They probably left it in a little bit of a craziness, like people didn't know what was going on, but I don't say shambles. An entire town up in flames. 18 families now homeless. Businesses destroyed. Anyway. Nothing can stop them from achieving their dreams, or so they think, because really how long can optimism like that last? Apparently, for any of you who are new to One Piece, Luffy's optimism knows no bounds. <laughs> Though it was supposed to be all smooth sailing from there on out, One Piece Episode 1 ended with the reveal that Pirate Captain Buggy the Clown wants the map they carry. Of course, every single pirate in One Piece in the East Blue wants that map. And we'll stop at nothing to get it. So how do things go for the intrepid... Intri intrepid? Intrepid. I still can't say words, apparently, on this channel. I don't know why I can't say words. Please correct me in the comments below what that word... How to pronounce that word, what that word is. And let's keep on going. We don't actually find out right away as episode two, The Man in the Straw Hat, opens instead on a young Luffy, still determined to make it as a pirate and practicing his gum gum pistol. If you don't know what that is, he is a stretchy man and that's when he throws his stretchy arm way back and then poof, with his fist in Windmill Village. Makino, the bar owner, cautions him that people might start to fear him now that he's different and warns him that devil fruit powers don't come without a price, each coming with the deal with the devil consequences of losing the ability to swim and losing all strength when in seawater. Kind of a problem for someone who wants to make a life at sea. That is the thing. I Every single pirate that eats the devil fruit sails the the salty seas and as soon as their body touches salt salty seas they become like a limp noodle <laughs> not that he lets that deter him for a second once shanks arrives at makino's bar yeah makino's yeah and luffy asks once again if he can join the crew shanks put puts him off with a with non-answers until his crew accidentally 
let slip that they're about to depart the village and head out in search of the One Piece with no intention of returning to the village. And of course, that puts little 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 Luffy just just his heart is ripped out of his chest, and you just see his sad little face, and he just goes off and cries. In present day, Nami is still trying to crack the safe containing the map of the Grand Line while Luffy pesters her to point where she tries to throw his signature hat overboard. Finally producing a crack in Luffy's perpetual sunshine optimism, the chit-chat greets on Zoro, who is trying to take a nap. And it seems like the not a crew is starting to really bond, despite protests to the contrary. No sooner do they have the map out of the safe than it becomes clear Luffy doesn't actually know where the Grand Line is on a map. <laughs> he's a pirate and he wants to go there and he has no idea where he's going. This is, this is a continual thing with Luffy. Nami supplies Luffy and Zoro and the audience by extension with a succinct ex explanation of the geography of the world. Nami reminds, remains skeptical about the existence of the treasure, but Luffy doesn't have much of a chance to convince her when a bright red smoke bomb hits the deck of the ship, knocking them all unconscious, and Luffy very quickly hides the map. You're not quite sure what he does to hide the map, but he hides the map in a very safe place. Which is very odd, how he hides the map. But hey, this is based off an anime. Things don't really make sense logically. And you just gotta go with it. You go with the flow when it comes to anime. The three wake up in a small crate without any of their belongings except for the map, which Luffy ate. <laughs> with Zoro and Nami suspecting that the marines are behind their captivity. Luffy corrects them and says a band of pirates took them hostage, which Zoro admit admits is an improvement since pirates lack training and are easier to kill. Luffy argues that they can reason with their captors pirate to pirate, and no amount of Nami telling him he's not really a pirate is going to give Luffy Luffy <laughs> Luffy imposter syndrome. Fortunately, they don't have to wait much longer to see what they're dealing with as the crate bursts open to reveal they're sitting in the middle of a literal circus surrounded by a terrified, tearful audience the audience does clap and you can see that their feet are literally chained to the floor so the the they are literally a captive audience because they are all captured it's kind of it's kind of ironic isn't it you cannot leave the circus because the circus will find you they aren't left wonder oh <laughs> oh what oh why did it Okay, that's weird. <clears throat> they aren't left wondering for long as Buggy himself joins them momentarily furious that their presentation didn't meet his standards of performance and then immediately irritated that Luffy is the only one who recognizes him. Despite getting his name wrong because the nose knows, a slight misunderstanding about Buggy's nose has him flying into a rage and it's safe to say... All of the villains they've met so far and will meet this season, he is probably the least emotionally stable. And that's saying something about pirates who are not great people. Ward's performance throughout is a highlight. He veers between hilarious and terrifying and at lightning speed and never leaves the audience or the characters sure of what to make of Buggy, which is supposed to be. He's kind of like... A much funnier Joker. If Joker was a pirate with a big clown nose and a pirate crew, you get the idea. Buggy's real problem isn't so much that they stole the map before he did, but rather that they're, in his mind, three little nobodies. Luffy takes issue with this and tells Buggy he's not a nobody. He's the future king of the pirates. A, re <laughs> a refrain... He will come to repeat a lot. As overblown as the confidence might seem, Buggy counters with the claim that he is the fiercest pirate captain in the East Blue with the fiercest crew as well and claim Alveda made as well. And we all saw how that turned out. <laughs> it looks like ego or at the very least a lot of self-confidence is the real thick trick to be <laughs> to being a pirate on the east blue yeah you gotta have a gigantic ego a lot of mental instability and apparently a proclivity to stealing gold 
Who knew? Now everyone can be a pirate. Sick of Luffy and Buggy's little back and forth, Zoro announces his identity to the crowd and threatens to kill any who don't surrender. Just as Buggy turns his attention to the famed pirate hunter instead, Nami panics and offers to give him a new circus act instead of the map. She tricks Luffy into revealing his powers and takes off out of the big top and into the village, which has been completely leveled by Buggy and his crew. Her escape attempt doesn't last long, and she's almost immediately dragged back in with the realization that the audience is made up entirely of captive townspeople. Buggy has Zoro and Nami hauled off to the green room while he keeps Luffy in the ring to determine the whereabouts of the map. And this is where you start to kind of get a little bit of Nami. She is not as uh, honorable as she might try and make her out to be. But she's never really said she's really honorable. She's a thief. And she's always said that she's a thief. So you start to suspect her a little bit in this scene. Just some of her actions and some of the things that she says just make you kind of go, hmm, maybe not everything is meets the eye. Back in Shell's town, Kobe and Helmeppo have been recruited into service and are present for the arrival of Vice Admiral Garp and his right-hand man, Bogard. It's another indication that the showrunners are at least somewhat looking to the future of the series by making Kobe, Hel Helmeppo, and Garp so prominent this early when they didn't really enter or re-enter the narrative proper until much later in the manga. The benefit of adapting something so long running, running is knowing what's going to ha come up later and working it in early. Plus, as far as television series goes, it helps to keep the scope of the world big. I agree. I think that that was a good change that they did with the live action because the live action is kind of an abridged version. Like the, the series is a thousand issues there there are a thousand issues of one piece this is a series that has been going on well past 10 years now it is the longest running anime and manga that there i think in the history of anime and manga please comment down below in the comment section if i am wrong or if there's another one out there please let me know i want to know if there is so you've got to think ahead you've got to kind of shorten things where they need to be shortened and take out some of the the fluff, a lot of the filler episodes, a lot of the filler plot lines, you got to take them out. You got to stay focused and stay on track. And I feel like they do that pretty well in this series. Captain Morgan catches Vice Admiral Garp on the chaos or up on the chaos caused by the Straw Hats. With his fair share of embellishments, the Vice Admiral doesn't believe for a second. Morgan casts the blame for the escape on Helmeppo, saying Kobe is the only reason his son survived at all. This little tidbit puts the cadet right in the size of, sights of the Vice Admiral Garp. Kobe is called in to see Garp, who noticed the new recruit acting oddly nervous in the yard. He and Bogart tells Kobe that they know he's friends with the pirates and accuses him of being in league with the pirates, forcing Kobe to come clean about how he met Luffy, admitting to Garp that he was afraid of telling the truth would prevent him from enlisting. Though Garp's entire demeanor changes once he hears Luffy's name. Instead, he just cheerfully suggests to Kobe that they track Luffy down together. And this, this really kind of gives you a wonderful view on this enemy. This is the kind of the big bad dude for the naval for the marines they're going to be hunting down luffy and luffy's going to be hunted down by his friend the guy who he saved the guy who technically owes him but i do enjoy the interaction because he asks kobe he's like do you owe allegiance and kobe says i am a marine and we are here to protect those who cannot protect themselves and of course big baddie's like hey you know what that means though right pirates are not good and and so in a roundabout way, he gets Kobe to basically say, yes, I will help you hunt down Luffy. In the back room of Buggy's Circus, meanwhile, Zoro and Nami find themselves in a bind. For the first time, we don't, or don't have Luffy acting as a mediator. Nami is still horrified at the destruction she saw out in the town, but Zoro doesn't dwell on it for long, fixating instead on how she ran out on them in the first place. The two are at an impasse, Zoro unable to trust someone he sees as too out for herself, 
and Nami thinking he's both reckless and a hypocrite. With no better way out, the two strike a reluctant truce, and she produces a hidden lockpick to get them out. Not a moment too soon, either, as they're inter- interrupted by the sounds of Luffy's screams. Screams slash he laughs? So it's one of those things, like, they... <laughs> you know that they're trying to torture him by stretching him out. Like, you're stretching out a rubber band, man. I don't know if that's going to do well for you in the end, but that's just my observation. The screams aren't screams of pain, though, since Luffy is enjoying having his limbs stretched all out at once. He continued cheerfulness in the face of what is supposed to be torture, infuriates Buggy, who decides psychoanalyst is the way to go, questioning Luffy's motives for even wanting to be a pirate. He suspects Luffy is trying to impress a mentor and correctly guessing the origin of Luffy's straw hat. Reveals that he knew Shanks once when they were younger, serving on the same crew. His reasons for hating Shanks are that he kept him out of the spotlight. And they say that I have ego problems. (laughs) And wonders if the same happened to Luffy, which is a bit of a departure from the manga, where Buggy holds Shanks responsible for causing him to accidentally eat a devil fruit, reasoning Shanks did it to hold him back. I, I, yeah, I think that this, this is a nice, while I do not like changes in canon, I think that this was a nice little touch. I, I admit that they probably didn't need to change that, but I, this is something that to me is a little bit minor and I'm fine with brushing over it. And I'm glad that the, it was pointed out where the difference came from though. But with this more vague fury, the cracks in Luffy's armor eventually begin to crack. Luffy stays determined to hold up under torture until Buggy threatens to torture one of the children from the town. Instead, Luffy breaks free of his bonds and delivers a punch right to Buggy's face, which sends his head flying off his body and into the audience, which is a little bit of a shocker. She's like, oh, there's a head that's in my lap now. Oh my! So I'm sure, as you can guess, the reaction from the audience was not quite appreciated. (laughs) While One Piece is violent, it isn't that violent. Buggy's head is just fine, as is the rest of his body, which can separate into chunks at will thanks to the Chop Chop fruit. Buggy finds a new solution to deal with Luffy, locking him in a tank slowly filling up with seawater, which, as we have stated earlier in the article, is basically anyone who has ever eaten a devil fruit, is the, it's their weakness. They cannot fight the effects of seawater on their bodies. Realizing force isn't working and re- reverse psychology isn't working, Buggy tries to get Luffy to join up with his crew instead, which naturally he refuses. Angry that Luffy refuses to believe Shanks and his friends about ab- or, and his friends abandon him, and more importantly, because Luffy implied Buggy isn't funny, the pirate tries to drown Luffy faster. Which I will say, there are some moments where Buggy is a little funny. I mean, his name is funny. It's Buggy. <laughs> this clown knows. Maybe that's just me. So what exactly did happen with Luffy and Shanks? In another flashback, we see little Luffy upset at the departure of Shanks' crew and feeling more than a little reckless when Hugman comes by Ma- Ma- Makino's bar. He picks a fight with the bandits just in time for Shanks and his crew to arrive and fight back. The situation finally calling for some violence. While they manage to stop the bandits, Luffy himself has gone missing. While the crew is distracted, Hugman? I'm going to say Hugman. Hugman. I'm just going to say that. I know it's probably wrong. I'm sorry. Hugman stakes Luffy out of the middle of, or takes Luffy out to the middle of the water and tells him no one is coming to save him. Something that winds up being wildly untrue when Shanks eventually shows up. But not before Luffy is thrown into the water by a sea beast, losing all strength and the ability to swim. Shanks banishes the beast, but not before the creature bites off his left arm. The two patch things up before Shanks leaves town. Luffy at last admits that he isn't ready just yet, but will eventually assemble a loyal crew to sail with, and Shanks leaves him with his treasured straw hat. If anyone is wondering where 
Luffy got his straw hat from. In their attempt to escape, Nami and Zoro aren't alone for long. Kabiji joins them and Nami tasks Zoro with distracting him while she finishes picking the lock on her cage. Since Zoro isn't much of a talker, he settles instead for antagonizing Kabaji over the death of his brother by feigning disinterest. Since Zoro is already strapped to a wheel of death, <laughs> Kabaji just, just spins him and begins throwing daggers at him, forcing Nami to work quickly. The distraction works as Nami frees herself and Zoro uses one of Kabaji's knives to cut his wrist free before the pair knocks him out. Working together at last, when her master plan involves beating up any clown they can find, it finally gets a smile out of Zoro and the two are off to rescue their captain. Oh, so much love. I love it. I love it so much. And we do get a really cool line from Zoro saying, hey, his optimism is starting to run off, run off on me. I, I like where we get, we're starting to get little pieces of why they're wanting to stay with Luffy. In my opinion, I Zoro was one of my favorite characters in all of One Piece, even though I didn't watch all of One Piece. He is still my favorite out of all of them, even though, I, I justice for Chopper justice for Chopper they free Luffy from his tank and he finally coughs up the map which Buggy grabs before he can while Luffy recovers on the floor Zoro and Nami are left to take on the whirlwind of sliced up bu bu Buggy body parts that's a mouthful <laughs> on their own something neither of them accounted for having missed Luffy's little decapitation show <laughs> showing he is Shanks protege through and through Luffy tells Buggy that he can take on any personal insult but draws the line at threatening his friends something that proves to be his guiding principle throughout the series they eventually manage to stop Buggy by boxing up all of his body parts in individual crates and free the captive, captive townsfolk while Zoro might have struggled with trusting Nami it was never a question for Luffy, who hands the map over with zero, with zero hesitation. Something that makes the navigator, or that takes the navigator by surprise. In Shell's Town, Garp spearheads a new campaign in pursuit of the pirates, with Kobe and Hel Helmepo's squadron in tow, and Morgan stripped of his power. His approach, he says, is not to target anything material, but instead to take away the pirates' dreams. Helmeppo looks ready to serve, but Kobe seems hesitant about his part in all of this. Back out at sea, Nami fixes the damage caused to Luffy's hat. And, and with him and Zoro hanging out on deck, it seems like everything is finally setting into place. That is, until Nami slips into the ship's cabin and places a mysterious call with her very adorable snail phone. It's very cute. It's very cute. To tell a mystery him that she has the map. Looks like Zoro was right to be skeptical after all. And with that, that is the second episode of One Piece live action. And it, I, once again, n 9 out of 10. I very rarely give things a 10 out of 10. I love the adaptation. I love the graphics. I loved Buggy the Clown. His, his personality was amazing absolutely spot on in my opinion i love zoro and nami's interaction i love that you start to see zoro kind of have an aff affinity like he he's enjoying luffy's company and you start to think that maybe nami is starting to feel the same way but twisty twisty she doesn't and i'm not going to reveal who that call was on the little cute little snail thing i love how they've got the snail calling in the live action i think that as as a spot on as you could be for the little snails where you take phone calls this was just about it i loved the design i loved how they were able to bring the snails in uh, my critiques don't really have many if any i'm trying to think of any critiques that i really had throughout this i think the only critique that i might have had yeah i don't have any i'll be honest i don't have any i know there will probably be some and please let me know in the comment section down below what's your thoughts on this episode 
were or are and if you have any critiques for the episode yes i know they changed a little bit of the uh continuity in the the canon i understand i've i i seem like a hypocrite right now but i've always said that i give grace where i can because i understand that there are some differences and there are some things that you have to change when you're at a when you're adept adapting when you are adapting material from a, either a book or a tv series to cinema or vice versa there are some changes that have to be made and i try my best to give a little bit of grace where i can understanding that yes they made those changes i don't think it was with a negative intention i think that it was done in good faith and with good intentions and that is where i stand as far as continuity and canon is concerned if you're going to change it just for the sake of changing it no don't do that change it because the the story needed you to the the plot needed you to the the forum needed you to the the way that you are presenting this needed to, it, there are things that needed to be changed understandable and i think that we should give grace there is no way you can do a one for one adaptation with anime or manga especially in a live action forum you just cannot do that and i believe that this was as as best as as perfect of an adaptation as you can get for a live action anime i think this is it i think this is the best we can do so thank you guys so much for sticking around with my video i hope to see you in the next video please like and subscribe and share this out to your friends let me know what your thoughts are in the comment section below and we'll see you next time have a fabulous rest of your week Bye bye